The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, everybody. Uh, we will go ahead and start in just about a minute. So one more minute to let a few more people join us, and then we'll go ahead and, and jump right in. All right, everybody, welcome uh, to the May 2018 Statis Worldwide webinar. Um, today we're going to be talking about design of experiments for pharmaceuticals, uh, with specifically um, active pharmaceutical ingredient development. My name is Martin Bezener. I'm a statistician here at Statis in Minneapolis. Um, so before I go any further, I would just like to ask if you can hear me, if you can click the um, raise hand button, just so that I know that uh, there isn't some technical problem here on my end. So it looks like, okay, Allison, uh, okay, so we've got a, okay, so it looks like, um, for those of you that can't hear me, the, 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 the problem probably isn't here. So today we have um, quite a few attendees. We have close to 50 people joining us here today. Okay, so to avoid disrupting, um, everybody is muted. You can use the questions feature on GoToWebinar, but today I'm actually on my own, so I might be a little slow to reply. So the best option would be if you have any specific questions about this webinar, is to go ahead and shoot us an email at stathelp at statties.com afterwards, and we'll go ahead and reply probably later this afternoon, as soon as we can. And this presentation will also be posted to our website, um, probably this afternoon or sometime tomorrow, as well as our YouTube channel. So let's go ahead and uh, get started here. So just a, a brief introduction to Statis for those of you that are new. We are a provider of DOE software, training, and consulting. We've been around for just a little bit over 35 years now. We've been here since uh, 1982. We have uh, over a dozen professionals plus a worldwide network of resellers, partners, distributors, and so on, some of which are joining us today. Um, our mission has always been statistics made easy, so our audience is um, formulators, scientists, people working in research and development, um, uh, engineers, and so on. So we really try to target that audience. Um, we've received a number of awards over the years, and also, probably most famously, we are the developers and the publishers of the Design Expert software. Recently, we just released version 11, which includes a um, an interface overhaul as well as a couple of other cool features so um, you might want to check that out if you're if you're interested okay so let's talk about today's webinar so unfortunately we only have about 35 40 minutes or so so we're gonna have to keep things pretty brief so the main purpose of today's webinar is is to provide a broad overview of the major types of DOE that you can use in pharmaceutical applications. So we're not gonna go into a ton of detail. Mostly, um, if you see something and you say, oh, hey, I could use that in the future, or, or, oh, hey, I want to learn a little bit more about that, that seems interesting, then I feel like you will have gotten uh, enough out of this webinar. Um, We'll show a couple of DOE Pharma examples, so DOE being design of experiments, uh, mostly related to act, you know, the development of active pharmaceutical ingredients. We'll show, a, we'll show a little bit of the functionality of design expert software, but not a ton today. And also, we'll provide resources for those of you that are interested in learning more. 
Okay. So uh, the, I'll do this one more time. If you are still with me, can you please raise the, you know, click the raise hand button just so I may, just so I can make sure. Okay, good. Just so I make sure there wasn't a connection interruption or something. So I think we are good to go. Okay, so we'll start off with the basics. So we do have some people here who are new to DOE. So I'll just talk a little bit about the basics of DOE and the advantages in the background, maybe spend five minutes on that. I'll spend about 10 minutes on factorial designs, 10 minutes on response surface designs, and about 10 minutes on uh, mixture design. So the format will be, I'll tell you what it is, we'll do an example, and I'll give you some tips and tricks for those of you that are uh, more advanced users. And then I'll kind of wrap up by giving you some other things you can check out, as well as just some general practical tips and tricks for those of you doing design experiments in pharmaceuticals. And then I'll conclude just some more re free resources and information you could check out at the very end. Okay, so let's go ahead and get right into the basics of DOE. So, um, many people are still doing what's called one factor at a time experimentation. So let's suppose you're trying to maximize the yield of some chemical reaction and you're varying three things. You're varying the reagent, temperature, and the concentration. And let's say, for example, you might, you, know, you might start with here at the middle, here at this run in the middle, which is kind of the middle level of all three of these factors. Okay, and you might think to yourself, well, my yield is decent here, but I wanna see if I can make it better. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hold concentration and temperature fixed and I'm going to kind of you know test a couple different reagents okay so I'll test maybe five different levels here and then I might realize okay well the yield goes up the most when my reagent is down here so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold the temperature and the reagent fixed and I'm going to try a couple different concentrations okay and I might see oh well the yield goes up if my temperature is over here so then finally, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold the reagent and the concentration fixed, and I might try a couple different temperatures along this axis here, and maybe at the end of the day, I'll realize that the, the best yield occurs at this point here. Okay, so that's something that can happen, and that's something that's done. So I'm doing a total of 12 runs here. Here's a problem. This and now, Like I said, this is still pretty common. If the theoretical maximum yield occurs, um, let's see here, occurs at this red spot here, there's a good chance that you're going to completely miss it because you're not doing any runs in this um, region here. And you'd kind of have to get lucky. You'd kind of have to see that, you know, you'd, you'd have to basically be in a situation where the factors are not interacting with one another in order to find that. Now, that's pretty unrealistic in most design experiments and pharmaceuticals. There's lots of factor interactions and there's also lots of nonlinear behavior, okay? So, uh, so it turns out that if the maximum yield actually occurs at that red point, there is uh, a pretty good chance you're gonna miss it. Now, design of experiments. A designed experiment would look something like this. You'd still have one run at the center of all of your of, of your three factors, but then you might look at combinations of the extremes here. Okay, you might look at some points that protrude a little bit outside of the edges of this space, and so on. Okay, so notice here how the you know we're doing 15 runs here. The points are spread out, and you know the the orientation is quite a bit different from the one factor at a time experiment. Okay, so the question is as well, if the maximum actually occurs at that red point, now notice how we didn't do a run, we didn't perform an experiment at that red point here. But the question is, is if the maximum yield actually occurs at that red point, can you detect it? And the answer is probably, um, because what you could do is after collecting the data, is you could build a statistical model that essentially uses these green points here that are circled in green to kind of interpolate the yield at you know at any points around it okay so if the data we collect is good we should be able to get pretty close to the maximum yield when we're doing numerical optimization we might not exactly find this theoretical maximum but we should hopefully get pretty close to this neighborhood 
So the benefits of a proper DOE include, well, first of all, you're covering your DOE space better. Okay. You have the ability to detect factor interactions as well as nonlinear behavior, which occurs quite often, um, especially um, when yield is the response. I've seen quite a bit of nonlinear behavior. Uh, both of these two points combine to give you a better understanding of the relationship between the factors. And the factors refers to the thing that you're tweaking to try to, you know, to try to whatever, maximize your yield or, or you know, uh, achieve some target stability or some target release profile and so on, as well as the responses that you're measuring. Um, as we saw in the previous slide, you should get better optimization results. You should get hopefully closer to the theoretical or the true maximum. And in many cases, you could get a lot more information with a lot fewer runs. Now, DOE may seem intimidating and complicated, but software, you know, there's a number of software packages out there, including Design Expert, that can make it pretty easy. Okay, so there's really nowadays, you know, one factor at a time, there's not, not a ton of reasons you should be using it aside from perhaps some rough range finding experiment or or something like that you should focus your efforts on a proper design experiment okay so let's get into the the meat of the talk here so the first thing we're going to talk about are factorial designs what are they we'll do a a, a pharma we'll do a pharma example of how you could use a factorial design what conclusions you can draw from it and then we'll wrap this up with some tips and tricks so a factorial design, it's one type of experiment you can do, and it's a very simple design. Now, in a factorial design, you have K factors. Okay, so we just represent the number of factors with the letter K. You could have a time, temperature, pressure, concentration, uh, amount of water. There's, a, you know, any infinite number of things that you could be varying. And each of these factors can take either a low or high value. So notice we're restricting ourselves to just two levels. In the RSM, the response surface section, coming up briefly, we'll talk about the case where we're doing more than two levels. And the goal of a factorial DOE, so when you'd want to use this, is when you want to statistically determine, so not just by eyeballing, but you actually want to get some statistics to determine which of the factors, as you go from its low to its high value, which of the factors impacts the response in a non-trivial way. And uh, also, do, are any of the factors interacting with one another? And factors in a factorial design can be varied simultaneously. So, you, you know, as you go from one run to the other, you may change two, the, you know, two of your factors or even three of your factors. So let's look. I think the best thing we can do is look at an example here of how you would set this up and how you would do this in, in the real world. So in this example here, researchers were trying to determine which factors affected the yield of a chemical reaction. They varied the following factors. So they had a low and a high reaction time. They had a low temperature and a high temperature. And they also varied the addition rate. So it was able to take one of two levels, four or six. Okay. So pretty straightforward. Only three things they were varying each that could take one of two levels. Yield in this case was measured in grams. Um, and ideally, they were hoping to see, you know, um, an increase in yield of three grams. That was kind of enough to, quote unquote, move the needle. Um, so what they did is they basically looked at all combinations. So they did not start at the center point and tweak these one at a time. What they did is they simply built a two to the three full factorial design and looked at all of these combinations here, okay? So let's take a look at this design. So this is the design that they had run, and this is what the unrandomized design looks like with the responses. So um, notice here how this, you know, normally you would randomize these runs, but they, you know, the first run, they did a reaction time of 80 minutes, temperature of 140, um, and an addition rate of four. Um, and then they measured the yield there. Um, reaction time of 100, temperature of 140, addition rate of four. Okay, and so on until they did all the runs and collected all eight yield measurements. Okay, so this is what the design looks like here. 
So if you were to draw this out, you know, if you were to kind of draw these points out in three-dimensional space, you'd see that this forms a cube. And that is not a cube, um, but it would form the, the space, the DOE space would form a cube, and you'd be doing runs at the corners. No, I kind of cheated. I, I I skipped some steps just to show you the conclusions that they came to, just for the sake of uh, for the sake of saving some time. Um, what we do in the next step is kind of once we collect our data, we run some we do some statistical tests to check as I go from my low to high of each of these factors, which of these are actually affecting the yield in a non-trivial way. Okay, so I built my model. And in my model, I put in reaction time, temperature, and the interaction between the two. I checked um, the addition rate. I checked some other interactions. And I realized that they're not significant. In other words, these p-values here for the remaining terms were very large. So a p-value that's small, let's say less than 0.05, okay? Typically, we would say that there's evidence that that... Um, that that is significant. In other words, it's driving the response in a non-trivial way. Okay, and you can see, for example, that the AB re that the, the AB interaction here has a very very small p-value. So there's a lot of evidence here that the reaction time and temperature are interacting with one another. And even though um, individually reaction time and temperature don't have tiny p-values, I put them in the model anyways just to support this two-factor interaction. So the conclusions here are that reaction time and temperature on their own kind of don't impact the yield, but they strongly interact with one another. And we'll see this just in the next slide here. An addition rate does not appear to meaningfully impact the yield. So the best way to, to look at what's going on is with a, with a picture. So here's kind of the, you know, the picture that tells the whole story. Uh, reaction time here. Uh, is let's see here where is my my pointer reaction time is on this on the horizontal axis here okay and this red line corresponds to the the high temperature of 150 degrees Celsius and the black line corresponds to the low temperature of 140 degrees Celsius so you could see that at the high temperature the yield goes down quite a bit as the reaction time increases. But at the low temperature, the yield goes up slightly as the reaction time increases. So this is an example of the factors interacting. The effect of reaction time depends on what temperature you're at. And so if we wanted to maximize um, the yield, uh, let's see here, we could see that here, it, here's a, a pretty high yield. But remember, their goal was to see what, you know, can we increase the yield by at least three grams? And it turns out that, well, maybe if you go from the low reaction time to the high reaction time on this low temperature here, that to me looks like it's actually a difference of more than three. So, you know, kind of an interesting thing going on. And this happens all the time. If you did this as a one factor at a time experiment, you wouldn't have you wouldn't get this complete story. So some tips and tricks for those of you that are a little bit more advanced and have already seen this before. By far, I mean, I've seen hundreds of these designs over the years. And by far, like the, the thing that causes 70 to 80 percent of the problems is choosing, you know, incorrect factors, meaning you're, you either miss something. OK, you forget to vary something or choosing a low and a high level of each factor. That's either they're either too far apart or they're too narrow. Okay, so a range that is too narrow or too wide will likely result in disappointment. So, for example, if you're baking a cake and you vary the temperature from 350 to 351 degrees Fahrenheit, you're not going to see any difference in the, you know, whatever the taste of the cake. If you vary the temperature, you know, zero and a thousand degrees, you're going to get either raw batter or you're going to get, you know, charcoal. So that's clearly, you know, those are kind of the biggest, um, uh, by far the biggest source of errors or disappointment. You could also add some center points. So notice how, you know, in the previous slide, we were only fitting these straight lines. If you're worried that you might need, you know, that uh, if you're worried that something like this is actually going on, where you have this nonlinear behavior, you could go ahead and add center points to detect curvature in the center of the design space. Now notice that the factorial designs, if you run every combination and you have k factors, 
um, you will, whoops, you will have two to the K runs. If you have 10 factors, it's all over a thousand runs. So consider doing fractions and in particular, the smallest designs um, that you should be interested in are minimum run screening designs and minimum run characterization designs in the design expert software. And finally, if you have too many factors that you're interested in, you could do a small screening experiment first to see if you can kind of sift through some of the noise and do a follow-up experiment with the small number of factors that survive the, the screening. Okay. All right. Well, that takes us that that was a pretty big that was a whirlwind tool tour of factorial designs. So let's go ahead now and move into response surface design. So we're going to get a little bit more complicated here. So response surface designs. So here's the story. Here's when you'd want to use these. These are a little bit more involved. They're a little bit more complicated, but on a related note, they'll also give you more information. So in a response surface design, we're varying K factors, and each factor has a low and a high value of interest. But now your, your level, you know, you're not going to be just looking at the lows and highs. You're also going to be looking at values, taking values inside the low and the high, or in between, or perhaps even slightly outside. Now, the goal of RSMDOE is to build a statistical model that approximates the relationship between the factors and the responses. And what we do with this model, so notice how we're not talking about, you know, what's significant, what's what's that. We're looking at building kind of a map. And we want to use this model to optimize the process, find where the minimum occurs, find where the maximum occurs, and so on. Okay, so slightly different goals than in a factorial DOE. So let's look at an example here. So here's an example where they were looking to maximize the antibiotic production. Okay. Now, what they did is what they had used a central composite design, which is an RSM design, and they varied two factors. They varied um, per fluorodecalin. So they this went from 20 to 60% volume over volume, and they also um, looked at glucose concentration, so from 8.75 to 16.25. And they were kind of tinkering around with both of these, see which of these would um, result in the highest level of antibiotic production. So they had actually measured four responses for every run that they had done. Um, and it turns out that the first response was really the, you know, it was an indicator of the amount of antibiotic that was being produced. They had also measured biomass, oxygen uptake rate, and glucose uptake rate as well, but we won't be so concerned with those. Okay, so here's the design that they did. Again, they did not do this as a one factor at a time experiment. They did this as a central composite design. So the design is here on the left. Um, whoops, sorry, the design is here on the, on the left, and you could see kind of how the points are spread apart. You'll see that they did three points here at the center. You'll see that they did uh, some, some points here kind of at the lows and highs, but they also added some intermediate levels that protruded just a little bit outside of this, this boundary here, this edge. Now, if it turns out you can't be experimenting beyond your original space, you'd move these points onto the, onto the edge here. Okay. So notice this is quite different from a, from a one factor at a time experiment. Okay, and notice here how if you look at glucose and you look at, if you look at the design here on the left, you could see that the, the factors are, are clearly randomized here, okay? All right, so again, I'm skipping a couple steps here just so I could show you the interesting things here, but after they did the experiment, they fit a quadratic model to the data, and you could actually see where the data points are because they're the red and the, the pink squares here. And you could see, for example, that antibiotic production pretty clearly was, you know, there's kind of this nice red region here where it's maximized here near the middle of the design space. Okay, so you could see these contours, and this graph is looks a little bit different in Design Expert 11, looks a little bit better. Um, but they could, you know, so clearly they're going to be want to, they're going to want to be investigating over here. Now, um, there were three other responses that they had collected and you could see, for example, that the relationship between, 
um, the two factors and the response is very different for all for all four of the responses. Notice how for biomass you're getting a completely different surface than you are for uh, the antibiotic production measurement. Oxygen uptake rate looks similar to the first graph, and then you could see that the glucose uptake rate there's this kind of ridge. So if you wanted to maximize, meaning you wanted to, you know, if you wanted, sorry, if you wanted to optimize, meaning you wanted to maximize a response, minimize another response, keep another response in range, you're going to be working with, you know, four very different uh, surfaces here. So you'd want to let the computer um, do the optimization for you. And there was no other information that I could find about the other three responses here. So we'll go ahead and just leave it at that. So. Some tips and tricks for those of you that may have, um, you know, may have already seen the basics before. Once again, I'm really going to hammer this point home. I'm going to say that the most important thing and the biggest, you know, by far the biggest thing that'll be, you know, define whether you have a, you know, successful experiment or not is figuring out what the DOE space is. So in other words, getting those lows and highs as correct as possible. Every once in a while, somebody will ask me, they'll tell me, hey, you know, design expert gave me this experiment and at this, you know, this particular combination, uh, you know, there's going to be a, a fire in the lab. Should I still do that run? Well, you know, the answer is obviously no. Um, so what you want to do is you want to avoid performing runs in regions where you know ahead of time there will be no reaction. You know, you'll get a yield of 0%. The response will be zero. The reactor, you know, the lid on the reactor is going to blow off. Okay. So if you have kind of a nice design where you can vary all your factors freely, you'd have something that looks like this, this square here. But in some cases, sometimes people might be in situations where they could kind of vary both factors from some low to a high, but they can't vary both of their factors up to the high level simultaneously. Okay. So what you'd want to do is you'd want to use a computer generated optimal design to kind of build the best design in this irregularly shaped region. Now, what you shouldn't do is you shouldn't, for example, say, oh, my new design space is going to be this red square, and then I'll choose a central composite design because it fits in this square. Because in a situation like that, you're, lo you're losing a lot of information here, and you're losing a lot of information here. So don't do that. And I'll be talking about this a little bit uh, going forward as well. So more tips and tricks. Add replicates to enable pure error estimates and lack of fit testing. Okay, so as you saw in the previous experiment, they did the center point three times. Familiarize yourself with Design Expert's optimal RSM design builder for non-standard problems. In many cases, you'll be working, you know, at least I've seen, design spaces that look like this, where they look like these uh, almost trapezoids, um, so to speak. And there's no really off-the-shelf designs that you can use. So you need to let the computer kind of pick the, the best design for you. Um, so you could use optimal design for that. Consider using, if there's one factor that's very hard to change, so something like oven temperature that you, you know, it takes forever for the oven to heat up. It takes another hour to bake whatever it is that you're baking, then cooling it down, resetting the temperature and so on. If you're in a situation, or, or for example, if you have a batch of something and you're splitting it up, consider using split plot designs. We're not going to be talking about them today. I just want to point out that they exist and um, explain to you when you'll be using them. Uh, so if you have a hard to change factor or something that's very time consuming, you can't fully randomize your design, you might want to look at using a split plot design. Now, uh, one other little tip. Every once in a while, we'll run into a response that's something like the number of passes under a sprayer. Clearly, it's a numeric factor, okay, but when design expert is giving you a design, you don't want to have something like, okay, run number four, we need to put it under the sprayer 1.8479 times. We either want it one or two times. So in that case, you consider using discrete factors, or if you're in a situation where perhaps you could, you know, um, where you have something like concentration, which is, you know, hypothetically could take, you know, um, many, many values, but maybe you only want to buy five different concentrations or prepare five different concentrations. Um, consider using discrete factors in a situation like that to make thing, make life a little bit easier for you. Okay.
So that pretty much wraps up the RSM section. So I'll briefly check just to see if anybody has, you know, if anybody asked any questions. So I do see that there are, there's at least one question. So since we have about a minute, I'll go ahead and, um, and uh, uh, just go through these questions um, quickly. And if, and if I can't answer them, I'll just encourage you to write in. So somebody says, if you separate lots of factors into smaller groups, is that kind of a grouped OFAD approach? It is to a certain extent. So um, uh, if I understand this question correctly, you're, let's say you had six factors, you hold four of them constant, you vary two of them, you do a DOE on two of them. Hold those constant, move on to the next two, holding the you know the four of them constant. If I'm understanding that, then yeah, that is kind of an OFAD approach. It's not a true OFAD approach because you will get some information about interactions about the things within the groups but it's not as good as doing a full experiment but sometimes you know you may be forced to do that because of resource limitations and then there's another question about how to select factors so um there's actually a great webinar that mark anderson did it's up on youtube for free about you know the half normal plot about the pareto chart um, so I would encourage you to check out our YouTube channel and find the webinar on graphical selection of effects. Okay, and of course, if you have any more questions, you can go ahead and, and, and send those to us after the webinar. But I think then we will go ahead and move on to our kind of our last uh, major DOE type here. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, go on to mixture designs. And I see there's another question or two that came in, and I'll get to it at the at the very end. So mixture designs. So these are, um, you know, you, you may have been doing them incorrectly. You, you may have been doing them not realizing it. But here's kind of the, the situation. K components are varied. So components meaning something you put into the blend. And each component has a lower or an upper bound. And all of the component levels in your experiment will be at or, you know, between these bounds. The big difference, the big uh, difference between mixture and RSM designs, the ones we looked at previously, is that the components must sum to a fixed number. For example, 100 volume percent, 20 grams, 10 milliliters, and so on. So if you're ever in a situation where some of the columns in your design need to sum to a fixed number, you have a mixture design. Okay? If you're working with something like amounts or concentrations, you don't have a mixture design. Okay? You could probably rework the experiment as a mixture design, but you wouldn't set it up as a mixture design because usually concentrations don't have to sum up. All of them in a row don't have to sum up to a fixed value. So the goal of mixture DOE is to build a statistical model, again, that approximates the relationship between the components and the responses. And we would use this model to optimize the process, see where, you know, where a minimum occurs, where a maximum occurs, and so on. Let's look at a, an API example here. So this is a transdermal patch. Um, so it's a, a medicated adhesive patch that is placed onto the skin to deliver a specific dose of medication through the skin and into the bloodstream. Now, this is what's called a single layer drug in adhesive, meaning the adhesive layer, okay, the glue it essentially, actually it also contains the drug. And in into, so in this type of patch, the adhesive layer not only serves to adhere to the, the var various layers together, along with the entire system to the skin, but it's also responsible for releasing the drug, okay, or the active pharmaceutical ingredient. The adhesive layer is surrounded by a temporary liner and backing. So here up here is a little picture of what's going on. Now, here are the, here's how they did this experiment. So they had four components that they were varying, okay, and 20% of this um, kind of by weight, so this this sums up to 100 weight percent. They were varying kind of the, you know, the, the masses of all the things that were going into this adhesive. So 20% was API. That was fixed because they know they need that much. Okay. Uh, high molecular weight polyisobutylene went from 50 to 70% of the total weight. Um, 10 to 20% was the low molecular weight polyisobutylene. They varied the cross-linking monomer from 4 to 7 weight percent. And they had also a permeation enhancer that was varied from 1 to 2% of the total uh, weight. And 20% again, 
20% of the weight was the API. And they had a bunch of different things that they were measuring here. So they, there was a lot of kind of things that they needed to get, you know, meet specifications. So one thing that they that they had measured was the T50 or the T50%, which is the time when 50% of the API was released into the bloodstream. They also had a shape factor, uh, a shape response that they were measuring that described kind of, you know, um, you know, how much drug, how the drug was being released. Was it linear? Was it um, proportional release? Uh, and so on. OK, did it look something like this and so on? They had a crystal measure, a crystal growth measurement, and also TAC. Okay, so these four things that they were measuring for every patch. Now, the, the goals, their goals here was to try to target a T50 of eight hours, minimize the shape parameter, minimize crystal growth, and try to target a TAC of 0.45. So uh, they're kind of a four different you know four different goals here okay so here's the actual design that they had built they built this as an optimal mixture design in design expert so notice here how um we would enter our factor information and notice that the api both the lower and upper bound is 20 which means it's constant you could have also made the total weight percent 80 and simply omitted api Okay, you could see that they enter their lows and highs for each of their mixture components. Um, they did a, they did 20 patches, so they did 20 runs essentially, and they measured for the four responses here. Again, this is there's 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 we have about 10 minutes left, and we do want to go through the responses, and we do want to go through some more tips and tricks, and show you some more resources. So unfortunately, I'm gonna have to. Have to skip some of these details, but this is essentially how they set up this design here. And they finally, so skipping some steps after they had built the model, they had optimized. They told the the software, "Hey, where can I find the you know some blends that kind of meet all four of my um, kind of criteria?" And so they did this numerically. So they found four, you know, the programs found. 14 uh 14 solutions first one being uh high molecular weight pib of 57.7 low molecular weight pib being 16.3 monomer being 4.2 weight percent and enhancer being 1.8 percent giving a, a an estimated t50 of 8 a shape parameter of 1.2 crystal growth of 2.7 an attack of pretty much 0.45 okay so they were able to do this through designed experiments. But they also wanted to know, hey, I don't want to just get one solution. I kind of want to find an operating window. I want to see where can I produce these patches and kind of ensure that my product is going to meet its specification. So what they had done is they had done some graphical optimization and found that this bright yellow region here, 99% of the transdermal uh, patches were expected to meet or exceed the specifications that were set. So kind of this would be, you know, if you were doing quality by design, this bright yellow region here would be the design space. Okay, so this gives them a really nice operating window here that they can use. Whoops. Okay. So just some tips and tricks. For those of you that are have already have some experience with mixtures, in general, we don't recommend trying to force a mixture design into a factorial or an RSM design. If you have a mixture, if you're in a situation where you're using a mixture design, where you have you know things that sum up to 100%, just use a mixture design. Um, in many cases, you'll get a better experiment and an easier analysis. Um, and in many cases, you simply can't rework a mixture design into a factorial or RSM design. There's only a couple cases where you can do that. So some people will try to kind of tweak the problem and kind of mess around with their bounds so they can use a central composite design or a factorial design. We generally don't recommend doing this. A factorial design is going to give you too many, you know, extreme points and it's not going to give you much information about curvature. And RSM design, again, these are not really optimal um, solutions. Um, if you're working with things like ratios and you really only care about ratios, 
where you're working with concentrations, yeah, an RSM design will probably be fine. But if you have a real mixture problem, use mixture DOE. Now, most mixture designs will need to be built as computer-generated optimal design. There's not a whole lot of canned off-the-shelf designs that you can use in this situation. Mixture designs generally are going to be a little bit nicer numerically. They're going to have fewer issues if the component ranges low. You know, if you subtract the low from the high, look at the range, are roughly the same size. Of course, don't force your problem, um, you know, just to satisfy this property. But this is just kind of a heads up. And if possible, include some replicated blends. This will, you know, es allow estimation of the pure error and give a lack of fit test. Now, we do have a free one-hour webinar that was posted to YouTube, which is, again, by Mark Anderson, which is basically, an, you know, a one-hour introduction to mixture DOE. We also have a, a book, Formulation Simplified, that was just published, which you can feel free to check out. For those of you that know DOE Simplified or RSM Simplified, we just published Formulation Simplified, which is targeted towards engineers and a little bit easier to read. Okay, so that kind of takes care of the meat of the, the, the presentation. So let's talk about just uh, briefly about some other designs you can use. Practical tips and tricks and conclusions, as well as um, some more resources and information you can use. So some other designs you may want to be aware of. You could look at combined mixture process design. So if you're in a situation where you're like coding a tablet and you're varying the amount of coding that you're putting on it, and you're also varying the formulation of the coding, and you're looking at you know some dissolution profile, that would be handled very nicely with a mixture um, process experiment. Or if you're baking a cake that has a formulation and you're varying the um, the temperature at which it's baked at, of course, you're probably not going to be doing that at a pharmaceutical company, but a mixture process design would, would handle that situation very nicely. I talked very briefly about split plot designs, which are for hard to change factors. There's also some space filling designs that Design Expert does if you just kind of want to have a rough, you know, if you want to spread the points apart as far as, as possible from one another to kind of just get a, you know, do some space, you know, some quote unquote space exploration, DOE space exploration. Um, you could go ahead and look at some of our space filling design. And of course, there's many, many more designs that I wish I could go in, you know, I wish I could talk about, but there's just not enough time. But I think in the, you know, in these these 40 minutes or so, we've covered quite a bit. Um, so, so here's some more practical tips and tricks. This is kind of more life lessons that you should take to heart. Um, you know, we've seen some heartbreak over the years. So here are some, some things you can do to avoid that. First of all, plan, plan, and plan some more. Spend a lot of time planning, figuring out what factors and mixture components you want to vary. A lot of times people later will realize, oh, I should have added this to the experiment or, oh, I should have also been varying this and, and so on. Spend time to figure out the lows and highs. These will define the DOE space. And like I said, I'd say probably 70 to 80 percent of the problems, the disappointing results, occur because of the DOE space being, you know, chosen inappropriately. And of course, it's easier said than done. If you knew what the space was, nobody would ever have any issues. But try to put some thought into it if possible. Before doing the experiment, evaluate it. So if you're doing factorial designs, look at power. If you're doing RSM or mixture designs, look at the fraction of design space. And also, when design expert gives you a design, go through the spreadsheet and kind of make sure that each run makes sense. So for example, if you see one run where the time is, you know, it's at high time, high temperature, high pressure, do you really want to be doing that run or do you need to kind of go back to the drawing board and try to figure out a way to eliminate those runs? Randomize as much as feasible. If you don't tinker with Design Expert, with the design order it gives you, you probably won't have any issues. Of course, ensure that your results can be accurately measured. So calibrate your equipment. You might want to take repeated measurements and put in an average if you're doing non-destructive testing. Be very careful when you're extrapolating beyond the DOE space. Now, when we did optimization, we were only doing interpolation. Extrapolation is a whole nother ball game. Um, so if you're going to be doing extrapolation and you find a maximum that's outside of the design space, take a look at how wide that confidence interval is around that prediction because it's probably going to be pretty large. It's going to be larger and larger the further away you go from the design space. And of course, 
you know, if you're stuck, consult with a DOE professional. It's much cheaper to fix a problem before the experiment is run than trying to salvage an experiment afterwards. So, so be careful and get help. You know, it might be worth paying somebody for an hour or two of their time rather than, you know, um, spending, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in six months on an experiment that has no chance of success. And finally, a couple more things. You could look into the idea of blocking. Um, don't choose the problem, again, to fit some particular design that you're comfortable with. Choose the design to fit the problem. And a lot of times this means you might have to use a computer-generated optimal design. If you optimize your response, do a few confirmation runs if possible. So, for example, if you get a maximum that occurs at a you know an interpolated point where you didn't do any runs, do some confirmation runs to see if your model can be validated. In other words, make sure you can reproduce the results. Now, of course, we have a free webinar as well, which is Practical DOE Tips of the sorry Tricks of the Trade. This is a little bit more advanced. You may want to take a look at it. Um, this was done by Pat Whitcomb about a year or so ago, um, if you're looking for some more kind of things that you might not find in textbooks. If you found this to be useful and you're kind of interested in some of this stuff, you might also want to consider taking our two-day workshop, which is Design of Experiments for Pharmaceuticals. So we talk about all of these topics, factorial designs, response surface designs, mixture designs, computer-generated optimal designs, optimization quality by design, and many more topics, except we spread this out over two days rather than over 45 minutes, and we show you how to do everything in the software. And the focus is pharmaceuticals, so we'll have case studies like tableting, extended release coding, API, quality by design, and so on. So you will hopefully see lots of relevant examples. So that's, you know, kind of a blown up version of this webinar here, so two full days. So here are some more resources that you could look at. First of all, our website has tons of free publications. So go to studies.com and use the search feature. There are tons of case studies, software tutorials, uh, many, many things that you could get for free um, if you'd like more information. Um, you could also use the help system in Design Expert, which is now online. Um, again, I already gave you the stat help email. If you're looking for more information about Design Expert or about our workshops, feel free to contact us here. We have a read-only forum, which I don't know if it's actually still around, but there's some questions that were answered there. And somebody asked me for more resources. Feel free to check out our Stadies YouTube channel. There's tons of, uh, tons of the things that I talked about today actually have a full one-hour webinar that goes along with them. And, of course, this is all free. There's also a couple more newsletters and um, informative uh, publications that we put out, like the Stat Teaser, the, DO, uh, the DOE FAQ Alert, and so on. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Hopefully you, you found some of this to be useful, and we'd like to wish you the best of luck in your future DOE work. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'll take a... Uh, what I'm going to do now is uh, just take a minute or so to see if there are any quick questions I can answer. Otherwise, um, feel free to send me them, um, send me these questions afterwards. So, somebody asked me about a one-factor RSM design. In previous versions, we did have a one-factor RSM design, but basically you could just build it as a one-factor um, optimal design. Uh, so we took that out because people were complaining that there were just way, way, way too many options. And so we tried to consolidate some things to make it less confusing. Somebody said, will the webinar be available after the session? Yes, it will be on YouTube. It will also be on studies.com. Um, somebody said, can you use DOE on animal experiments? How to distinguish between true responses and inter-animal variations? Well, that's a very good question. So what you're looking to do in that case is you're looking to, we've seen some examples where people were um, using our software on pigs. And what they were doing is this, they were basically, you know, um, uh, infecting pigs and they were trying to, you know, heal up their wounds or something like that. But basically what they had done is they were trying to, what they had done, what they had to do is they had to size the design correctly so they can distinguish, you know, noise from the signal. Um, sorry, uh, yeah, the signal from the noise. So the biggest um, thing there on how to 
distinguish between true responses and inner animal variation would be you have to have um, either a signal that's big enough or enough runs to, to, to kind of um, be able to distinguish between those two. Um, somebody had asked me about, can you please guide towards detailed RSM design webinar from Stadies? Now, I don't know if we have one that's dedicated towards RSM designs, but you might want to check our, our web page. Um, but we have a ton of tutorials on our website. We have, you know, some, some software examples that kind of go through step by step. Um, we have some case studies and so on. And of course, you could always feel free to reach out to me. And somebody asked me, how do you, do you use linear spacing or log spacing when choosing the dose? That's a very good question. If you're expecting there to be some exponential relationship, you'd want to put things on a log scale. If you expect things to behave nice and linear, then you'd want to choose um, uh, you'd want to choose um, uh, regular spacing or linear spacing. Okay, and sometimes what people will do is they'll they'll try to fit the model to both to the or the linear spacing, and then they'll try to um, they'll maybe look at the log as well. And finally, say uh, hi to Pat and Sherry from Scott. We'll do Scott Hunter. I will do this. And finally, can you share your email address apart from Stadies to get um, help? Well, actually, the, the stat help um, email address, I'll be um, using that one. But if you are looking for my email address, I will go ahead and write it here to everybody. So you can send, uh, let me go ahead and type it in here, um, stadies.com, so everybody can contact me. Although, again... Um, I will encourage you to use the stat help email because if I am not around, somebody else can answer these questions. All right, everybody. So thanks again. So I think we've we've gotten all of these questions and we'll probably get more trickling in throughout. So thanks again. Hopefully you uh, you got something out of this. Again, you could consider our two day workshop if you really want to, you know, some intensive training in this. Otherwise, feel free to check out the plethora of free resources that we have out there. So thanks again. Enjoy your morning, your afternoon, your evening, wherever you are. Um, and we'll hope to see you again for another webinar in the future. So take care now. Mm -hmm.